the scapholunate ligament. There are eight little carpal bones floating around in your wrist that are very important to how your wrist works as it is the platform in which we position our hands, which is how we interact with the world. These little bones work with the bigger radius and ulna bones to create a movable platform so we can do things like write or throw or hammer or punch things. When the connections between these bones are injured, we call it carpal instability. And unfortunately, it is a common problem. This video is about the most common cause of carpal instability, injury to a tiny ligament called the scapholunate ligament. This ligament is crucial to the biomechanics of the wrist and is frequently injured in sports or those who fall. This is an injury that hand surgeons still debate the best way to treat. This is because this injury, even if treated well, can result in limited wrist function, pain, and arthritis. The goals of this video are to introduce you to the anatomy of the wrist, the importance of the scaphalunate ligament, what happens when it's injured, and how it's treated. So the anatomy. This is a little refresher from my other wrist videos, but to review, the eight carpal bones are divided into two rows, proximal or closer, and distal, further away. There's four bones in each row. These bones are connected to each other by various ligaments. The distal row is also closely attached to the metacarpals. You can see my separate video on those, so those bones don't move much. The proximal row does move a lot. No muscles or tendons attach to the proximal row, so their motion is very much dependent on the forces that go through them from tendons pulling above and below the wrist. The scaphoid and the lunate are bones within the proximal row, and their motions are not only really important, but also very complex. This is because their motion is also linked to the motion of other carpal bones and the forces going through the arm. The motion between the scaphoid and the lunate is tightly linked by the scaphalunate ligament, which I will just be calling the SL ligament from here on out. The SL ligament is a C-shaped ligament that connects the scaphoid and the lunate. It has three components, with the dorsal or back component being the most important, and it is the biggest and strongest component. How the wrist moves, the biomechanics of the wrist. The wrist moves in many directions. These are described as flexion and extension, radial and ulnar deviation, and supination, pronation. In real life, these motions are rarely done in isolation. As the wrist goes through even simple motions, the proximal row bones are flexing, extending, sliding, and supinating and pronating. For example, when the wrist extends, the scaphoid also supinates and the lunate pronates. In wrist flexion, the scaphoid pronates and the lunate supinates. Hopefully, I've been able to communicate how complex and intricate the motion is at the proximal row. When this well-coordinated motion breaks down, we start having issues as will be discussed momentarily. If you come out of this remembering just one thing, remember this. The scaphoid wants to flex. The lunate wants to extend. This is important for what happens when the SL ligament is torn and potentially recognizing it on x-ray. The injury. The most common way for the SL ligament to be injured is a fall onto an outstretched hand. This results in forced wrist hyperextension, ulnar deviation, and sometimes even supination between the two rows of carpal bones. As a little aside, this type of injury to the wrist is often a spectrum of injury. This means that sometimes only the SL ligament is injured, but sometimes other ligaments are torn. The most severe of these injuries is something called the perilunate dislocation, where the lunate bone actually pops out of its place and squirts into surrounding tissues. This is a bad injury as many ligaments are torn and it can create pressure within the carpal tunnel, the tunnel made out of little carpal bones, and the nerve that goes through it, causing an acute carpal tunnel syndrome. This is pain and burning and numbness and tingling. This situation is a surgical emergency. The diagnosis. It all starts with an exam. There's usually pain between the scaphoid and the lunate. There is also often pain with activities involving wrist motion and loading of the hand and wrist. Initially, there may be a lot of swelling. As things progress and swelling goes down, the patient may get clicking or popping of the wrist. There is also often stiffness. X-rays are always part of the evaluation, and sometimes you can see the space between the scaphoid and lunate has widened, or you can see the alignment of the carpal bones being off. A clenched fist, which loads the bones within the wrist, may show us a widening 
not seen on normal x-rays. MRI is something that can help us see the soft tissues with more detail, and this includes the SL ligament. Sometimes contrast is put into the joint, called an MR arthrogram or MRA, and if the contrast leaks between the two bones, we know there's a tear between them. Sometimes the best way to see if there is damage is to look directly at the ligament, which can be done arthroscopically with a scope and very small incisions. If this surgery is planned, the surgeon will also likely talk to you about specific treatments that they may want to perform depending on their findings. So the treatments. For mild sprains of the SL ligament or small tears, sometimes rest and immobilization in a cast followed by physical therapy does the job. This is not enough, then we may have to start considering surgery. And as mentioned, sometimes surgery is used to help make the diagnosis if it's unclear. Surgery has many variations. It may be arthroscopic or open, meaning we make a bigger surgical incision, depending on how bad the tear is, what else may need to be done, as well as surgeon preference. With partial tears, sometimes all that is needed is cleaning things up. If the SL ligament is completely torn and it's early in the injury process, then often a direct repair with sutures to bone can be done. If it is a more chronic injury, then we may have to reconstruct the ligament using other tissues and or using a suture to replace or help the ligament. Other factors that play into the decision making is if there are any other injuries or ligaments torn, there often is. There are many, many described surgeries for tears of the SL ligament. This is because it is a common problem without a clear superior way of fixing it. As mentioned, this is a weird C-shaped ligament which is hard to reproduce surgically. Also, the forces going through these bones is incredibly complex. And there are usually other things that need to be stabilized during the surgery. Surgeon preference often plays a large part in the best way to get things fixed. After surgery, often you're gonna be immobilized for six to eight weeks after surgery to let things heal and scar in. Sometimes there'll be pins that must be removed. When the time is right, there'll be diligent therapy for the wrist to regain strength and range of motion. Often around three months from injury, there's a return to normal activities, but for maximal recovery, it can take a year. The long-term outcomes. If you have surgery for an SL tear, you will likely always know that your wrist is different. There likely will be some stiffness and there may be some discomfort and weakness. There's also a chance that the arthritis that we are trying to prevent still happens, even if everything was done right. If a complete tear is neglected or surgery does not work, then a very predictable pattern of arthritis will then occur. This is called scaphoid lunate advanced collapse, slack. Because the biomechanics of the joint are altered, things move against each other instead of with each other. Over years, the cartilage of the joints being rubbed against each other then begins to break down. Eventually, there's no cartilage. Then the bone grinds on bone. This causes inflammation and pain and soon leads to stiffness. For slack wrist, the first area of breakdown is at the tip of the radius and the scaphoid. Eventually, it involves this whole joint. Then, arthritis between the capitate and lunate will be noted. Usually, the cartilage between the radius and the lunate is spared, which allows for some salvage procedures to be done later on, but that will have to be a whole other video. So there it is. Hopefully, this helps you understand the scapholunate ligament more, how your wrist works, what happens if there's injury, and how a surgeon's treated. I'm Dr. Lucius Pomerantz, board-certified orthopedic hand surgeon, trying to help you better understand common injuries and their treatments. Please make sure to get notifications for my new videos and to like, share, and subscribe. Thank you.